Hey guys, it's Metacopsis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our physiology playlist. We're talking endocrine physiology. In previous videos, we talked about the difference between water-soluble hormones and fat-soluble hormones and how their actions are different. We talked about the growth hormone. We talked about somatomedin C, also known as insulin-like growth factor 1. Today, it's time for prolactin, which is pro lactation why does it end in in because it's related to protein prolactin is a polypeptide this video is divided into two parts the first part physiology the second part pathology who is the chief executive officer of the endocrine system hypothalamus is how about general manager pituitary and then the pituitary will talk to the employees thyroid adrenal cortex and gonads but the pituitary cannot talk to the independent contractors how many thalamine do you have? You have two. How many hypothalamus? Just one. In the midline, underneath it, there is the pituitary, anterior pituitary and posterior pituitary. As you know, prolactin comes from the anterior pituitary. Here is the lovely hypothalamus. This is the anterior pituitary. The hypothalamus can tell the anterior pituitary to secrete more prolactin by getting the TRH going. This TRH will stimulate prolactin release from the pituitary. The same hypothalamus can secrete dopamine, which is the prolactin inhibiting factor, which inhibits prolactin release. Serotonin, to a certain extent, can increase prolactin release. That's probably why in depression, where serotonin is usually low, prolactin release is down and lactation is more difficult. Okay, medicosis. So when it comes to the relationship between the hypothalamus and prolactin, there is the releasing factor and the inhibiting factor. Which one is more important? The inhibiting factor is more important. That's why if I lose my hypothalamus, I will lose both TRH and the dopamine. Which one is more important when it comes to prolactin? Dopamine. The inhibitor is more important. So, with hypothalamus damage, dopamine is toast, no inhibition to prolactin. Prolactin will increase and I will have hyperprolactinemia. Look at the cell. Prolactin comes from the red cell, i.e. from acidophil, just like growth hormone. But the other ones come from basophils. Look at that. Prolactin comes from lactotrophs or mammotrophs. These are the acidophils, which are chromophils because they are colorful and they are part of the anterior pituitary. Growth hormone and prolactin are similar. Both of them are polypeptides. So metropin, prolactin, if it ends in IN, it's usually a protein or a polypeptide. Secreted by acidophils, both of them. Both of them are secreted by the anterior pituitary. Both of them utilize the JAK-STAT pathway. Both of them are prolactation. The structure of the mammary gland of the breast. Skin is here, here is the nipple. Behind the nipple, there is the duct. And then, who makes the actual milk. The acinus does. The plural of acinus is acini. This is a breast lobule, breast lobule, lobule, and this is a singular acinus, acinus, acinus. How do they make milk? They have secretory cells, which have secretory granules. Just remember your histology. Secretory cells have to store those secretory granules. That's why they have to be big enough to have enough space to contain these granules. That's why secretory cells are never squamous. They are cuboidal or columnar because squamous does not have any space in it. Next to those acini, there is myo, muscle, epithelial cells, and these will squeeze the acinus to try to get the milk to the outside. The hormones that target the breast. Estrogen comes from ovaries from the placenta during pregnancy and from fat cells. Estrogens will mature the nipple and the ducts they will make the ducts grow and branch. They increase fat deposition, contributing significantly to the breast mass. But they did not put an acinus here. Who's going to put the acinus or the alveolus or the lobule? That's progesterone, which comes from the ovaries and from the placenta during pregnancy. Why did we call it estrogen? Because it causes genesis of the estrus cycle, the menstrual cycle in animals. Why progesterone then? Pro gestation. I am not anti-gestation. I am pro-gestation. 
Why sterone? Because it's a steroid. It's a lipid hormone. Oh, that makes sense. But prolactin, oxytocin, these are not lipid hormones. These are polypeptides. Prolactin will tell the acinus, which was made by progesterone, to add milk inside, produce and secrete the milk. However, prolactin did not push the milk forwards to the nipple. Who's gonna do that? Oxytocin is for milk let down. Prolactin came from the anterior pituitary, from the acidophils. Oxytocin came from the hypothalamus and was stored in the posterior pituitary. Here is a shocking fact. Both estrogen and progesterone inhibit milk secretion, but prolactin promotes lactation. It promotes milk secretion. So, during pregnancy, the placenta entered the chat. The placenta is gonna make tons of estrogen and progesterone. The ovaries contribute too. In other words, during pregnancy, we have tons of estrogen and progesterone floating around. These two hormones are inhibiting milk secretion. That's why throughout most of the course of the pregnancy, there is no lactation possible. But around labor and delivery, as the placenta starts to dislodge and becomes functionless, Estrogen and progesterone levels will drop like a rock. Now prolactin is left uninhibited to boost and promote milk secretion and production. That's why once the baby is delivered, prolactin single-handedly will raise production and secretion of milk and mommy will be able to breastfeed. So prolactin was high during the second half of pregnancy. However, it could not act because its action was suppressed or counteracted or antagonized by estrogen and progesterone. But once the placenta is gone, estrogen and progesterone will decrease, prolactin is left unchecked to increase milk production and secretion. Here is another nugget. During pregnancy, the placenta secretes a hormone known as human placenta lactogen. Lactogen, yeah. It might boost prolactin and milk secretion, whether directly or indirectly. Suckling stimulates the nipple, which stimulates the hypothalamus in the brain. The hypothalamus releases TRH, thyrotropin-releasing hormone, which is the stimulator of prolactin release. Now the anterior pituitary will release more prolactin, leading to more milk secretion. The greater the nipple stimulation, the greater the milk secretion. This is the story of nursing mothers, suction cups, suction pumps, and wet nurses. Throughout history, it was common for wet nurses to nurse babies for a living, even if the babies were not her own. How did she do that? Well, stimulation of the nipple. If nipple stimulation ceases for about a week or so, milk secretion will drop like a rock. So as long as the wet nurse kept the nipple stimulated, like by nursing a child at least once a week, she can keep the process going and the milk flowing. Conversely, no nipple stimulation, no milk secretion, and this is the story behind weaning. Prolactin actions. Prolactin will boost milk production and secretion. This milk is rich in casein and lactoalbumin. Casein is a chief component of cheese. That's what the word means, casein. Cheesy. Don't forget, mommy's milk is the best. However, it is deficient in iron, vitamin D, and vitamin K. Just remember, fedic. Okay, medicosis, what is the clostrum? Clostrum is the peripartum milk. It's the milk secreted from the breast of the mother just before delivery and just after delivery of the baby. After that, regular milk will kick in. Clostrum usually has a lower quantity and almost no fat as compared to the regular breast milk. Prolactin inhibits ovulation. What the flip? That's why it's less likely for a lactating mother to become pregnant again. It can happen, but it's less likely. Because prolactin is a natural contraceptive. Hey, medicosis, is it 100% effective? Nothing is 100% effective. Is it relatively effective? Ah, uh, not very. It can work, but you should not bet the rent money on it. Prolactin inhibits GnRH from the hypothalamus. When you inhibit GnRH, you will decrease FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary. This will lead to no ovulation. That's why it can work as a contraceptive, but do not rely on it 100%.
What are the hormones that help us make and secrete milk? Of course, I've talked to you about estrogen, progesterone, prolactin, and oxytocin. However, you also need insulin. Why? Because look at these. These are proteins. Oh, how can I build up proteins? You need a protein anabolic, like insulin, like growth hormone. That's why growth hormone and prolactin are both prolactation. Both use the JAK-STAT pathway. Both come from the acidophils in the anterior pituitary. Both are polypeptides. Some farmers will give growth hormone to dairy cows to boost milk production. This is the reason. Moreover, the hormone cortisol, which is a catabolic for carbs and lipids, when you break down carbs, you get glucose. When you break down lipids, you get free fatty acids. And these are needed to make milk because they are important sources of energy. And don't forget that regular milk, unlike colostrum, contains fat. Parathyroid hormone, because milk contains calcium. Where did the calcium come from? Well, parathyroid hormone will give you some. Whether by talking to the kidney, by talking to the bones, or by talking to the gut via vitamin D. Next, the story of human placenta lactogen. HPL secrete from the placenta during pregnancy. It's also known as chorionic somatomamotropin. I love the name. Why IN? Because it's a polypeptide. Why chorionic? Because the placenta came from the chorion. Which part of the placenta? Is it cytotrophoblast or syncytiotrophoblast? Syncytiotrophoblast. Why call it somato? Because like growth hormone, it's a somatotropin, which means like growth hormone, it is diabetogenic. It's gonna raise sugar in my blood. And this is the theory behind gestational diabetes, diabetes that started during pregnancy. It's probably caused by human placenta lactogen. And the last part, mammotrope. Trope means to grow. To grow what? Mammary glands, because it mimics prolactin. Let me introduce you to the story of two enemies, prolactin versus estrogen. Prolactin is prolactation, but estrogen inhibits milk secretion, so it's anti-lactation. Prolactin is anti-ovulation because it talked the hypothalamus into suppressing the GnRH, which decreased LH and FSH from the anterior pituitary. But estrogen, of course, is pro-ovulation. Prolactin is trying to inhibit estrogen, and estrogen is trying to inhibit prolactin's function. Next, the prolactin inhibiting factor, dopamine. Dopamine has different functions in different parts of the brain. For instance, in the nigro striatal pathway, dopamine is related to movement. Too much dopamine, too much movement. Too little dopamine, too little movement. Also, dopamine in the mesocortical limbic pathway is related to mood and rewards. Too much dopamine, I feel euphoric, even psychotic. Too little dopamine, life is meaningless. Dopamine in the tuberoinfundibular pathway is related to endocrine function. Namely, dopamine is anti-prolactin here, because dopamine is the prolactin inhibiting factor. Too much dopamine equals no prolactin. Too little dopamine equals hyperprolactinemia. And this hyperprolactinemia can lead to galacteria in females, amenorrhea in females, and impotence in males. Why is that? Because when prolactin is high, it's going to inhibit GnRH from the hypothalamus, which will inhibit FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary. No estrogen, no progesterone, amenorrhea. No testosterone, erectile dysfunction, and gynecomastia. Here is dopamine, different parts of the brain, and different functions. Pause and review. This is what happens with too much dopamine. This is what happens with too little dopamine. To learn more about this topic, I have a separate video titled Dopamine Neural Pathways. Let's take it to the next level. Suppose that I'm taking a dopamine agonist bromocryptine. Just like dopamine, it will inhibit prolactin. So, after taking bromocryptine, it's very unlikely to lactate. Conversely, if I'm taking a dopamine antagonist, like the antipsychotics, the medications used to treat schizophrenia, or metoclopramide, the famous anti-emetic. These are dopamine antagonists, which means no dopamine activity. No dopamine activity equals prolactin is left uninhibited, hyperprolactinemia. So after taking dopamine antagonists, I can suffer from galacteria, amenorrhea, impotence, gynecomastia. 
Estrogen and prolactin are enemies. Dopamine and prolactin are enemies. TRH and prolactin are friends. Human placenta, lactogen and prolactin are also friends. They share the same goal. So to recap, the hypothalamus secretes TRH. TRH goes to the anterior pituitary and tells the pituitary to secrete lots of prolactin, which goes to the mammary gland to secrete and produce milk. However, the same hypothalamus will also secrete the prolactin inhibiting factor known as dopamine, which inhibits prolactin release from the anterior pituitary, and when dopamine is high, lactation is very difficult. Conversely, if dopamine is low, lactation is hyper. Hashtag galactorea, hashtag hyperprolactinemia. Remember, with each hormone, you need to be able to recall the activity and the regulation. Regulation of prolactin, TRH increases prolactin. Estrogen tries to inhibit prolactin. There may be an exception later in pregnancy where estrogen is trying to boost prolactin. However, estrogen still inhibits milk secretion while prolactin is trying to boost milk secretion. It's only when the placenta is gone, estrogen will drop like a rock. Prolactin will be left uninhibited to boost milk secretion. When dopamine is high, prolactin goes down. But when prolactin is high too much, well, we are sick and tired. We have too much prolactin here. This will raise dopamine to bring prolactin down to normal. This is the negative feedback. There are many, many factors that can influence prolactin secretion, including suckling, sleep, stress, and sex hormones, as we talked about. And this is the same negative feedback again. Prolactin is a water-soluble hormone. It can float freely in the blood because the blood is made of water. So prolactin will reach your cell surface very quickly. But once it comes close to the cell, it will realize that I am water-soluble, but the cell membrane is lipid by layer. Water cannot diffuse in lipid. That's why the receptor has to be on the outside surface of the cell. Then a middleman will come and connect the receptor on the outside with the nucleus on the inside via signal transduction. This is the story of the JAK-STAT pathway. So prolactin and growth hormone work by the JAK-STAT pathway, which is a non-receptor tyrosine kinase. We talked about all of this in the last video. Here is prolactin this time binding to its receptor. Then JAK will get active by phosphorylation or autophosphorylation. When JAK is active, it will activate STAT. When STAT is active, it will talk to the nucleus. It will tell the nucleus, hey nucleus, I want some transcription, some translation, protein synthesis. I want lots of proteins because I'm trying to make milk in this mammary gland. And that's the story again. Here is prolactin binding to its receptor. Two monomers, but when they get active, they become a dimer after prolactin binds. And then a prolactin will activate JAK, which will activate STAT, which will enter through the nuclear pore into the nucleus, talk to the nucleus. Hey, nucleus, I want you to replicate your DNA. I want you to make RNA, which is transcription. And then I want you to make proteins, which is translation. All the proteins necessary to make milk. And all of that happened inside the mammary glands of the breast. We're done with physiology. Let's talk about pathology. What are the causes of low prolactin secretion? It could be Sheehan postpartum necrosis, damaged pituitary gland, or empty cell syndrome. Hypersecretion of prolactin is caused by prolactinoma, low dopamine, i.e. damaged hypothalamus, and primary hypothyroidism. Again, if I'm taking dopaminergic blockers, dopamine activity will go down, prolactin is left uninhibited to cause hyperprolactinemia. In females, galactorrhea and amenorrhea. In males, impotence and gynecomastia. The same exact thing happened with an anti-dopaminergic anti-emetic known as metoclopramide. This is an amide, this is an amine. Remember, dopamine is one of my catecholamines. So dopamine is made in the brain, it's also made in the adrenal medulla. What if I have a tumor in the pituitary known as pituitary adenoma? Well, it depends on the type of the tumor. It could be made of prolactin cells, prolactinoma, or growth hormone cells, somatotropinoma, etc. If it's a prolactinoma, prolactin will go up. However, when the tumor grows bigger and bigger and bigger, it will press on everything else. That's why the pituitary can no longer make FSH and LH because the gonadotrophs are toast. It cannot make TSH because the thyrotrophs are toast. It cannot make ACTH because the corticotrophs are flattened by the pressure from the tumor. The tumor is crowding out the normal cells. 
as the pituitary tumor grows bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, it's going to press on the optic chiasm, which is here, giving me biotemporal hemianopia. To learn more about this, go to my endocrinology playlist. Prolactinoma is the most common subtype of pituitary adenoma. When prolactin is high, it inhibits gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which inhibits FSH and LH, which inhibits the ovaries or the testicles. What inhibits the ovaries, amenorrhea, what inhibits the testicles, impotence and gynecomastia. So, my prolactinoma patient will present with amenorrhea and galactorrhea, if female, or impotence and gynecomastia, if male. Don't forget the bitemporal hemianopia causing visual defect. It's a tunnel vision. Anytime you have a tumor growing in your brain, this will raise the intracranial pressure, which can trigger the Cushing triad i.e. the Cushing reflex, not to be confused with Cushing syndrome or Cushing disease or Cushing ulcer. On my channel, I have a special video titled The Cushing Reflex. Physical exam. Well, if you get the perimetry, you will find bitemporal hemianopia, which is tunnel vision. If you examine the fundus of the eye, papilledema, because of the tumor raising the intracranial pressure. Don't forget that the optic nerve is part of the central nervous system. Duh! If you want to see the tumor, CT scan or better, an MRI. Treatment! Well, it's too much prolactin. How can I inhibit prolactin? Give me dopamine or dopamine agonists such as bromocryptine, capergoline, or one of the newer dopamine agonists. And you can remove the tumor by surgery. Okay, medicosis, this was the tumor story. But what if I have hyperprolactinemia, whether or not it's caused by a pituitary adenoma? How can I diagnose that? Well, 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 you can measure prolactin level in the blood. You can measure dopamine level in the blood. Of course, in hyperprolactinemia, we expect prolactin to be high. We expect dopamine to be low. What else other than tumor could cause hyperprolactinemia? It could be disruption of the hypothalamo hypophyseal axis, such as hypothalamic damage. It could be a medication that's antidopaminergic. It could be Parkinson's disease because this disease is antidopaminergic, so to speak. As the pituitary tumor grows and grows and grows, it's going to press on the optic chiasm, hashtag by temporal hemianopia, and it's going to press on the surrounding normal cells, leading to delayed puberty, decreased brain development, decreased metabolism, cold intolerance, weight gain, constipation, etc., and decreased stress tolerance, decreased plasma glucose, etc. Don't forget that my pituitary came from the ectoderm. The anterior pituitary came from surface ectoderm, from the roof of your future mouth, the stomodium. But the posterior pituitary came from the floor of the diencephalon. That's why we call it neurohypothesis. This is the anterior pituitary trying to develop, and this is the posterior pituitary trying to develop. Look at that. Anterior pituitary came from the roof of the future mouth, the roof of the stomodium. This is the stomodium, and this is the buccopharyngeal membrane. You can say that the anterior pituitary came from the roof of my pharynx. Enters craniopharyngioma. It's a tumor in the brain, in the cranium, starting from the roof of the pharynx. Oh, anterior pituitary. Yeah, that's what we mean. It can cause pressure atrophy to everything, including the cells that make growth hormone, leading to short stature, bitemporal hemianopia, papilledema, you diagnose with MRI, and this tumor is notorious for having calcification, so it can show up on a CT scan. Both craniopharyngioma and pituitary adenoma can lead to bitemporal hemianopia. Pause and review. Now let's talk about hypoperfusion. Hypoperfusion to your heart, you get angina or MI. To your brain, TIA or stroke. To the kidney, perirenal azotemia. To the lung, red infarction. To the small intestine, mesenteric ischemia. To the large intestine, ischemic colitis or colonic ischemia. To the fingers, Renaud's phenomena. To the liver, ischemic hepatitis. Hypoperfusion to the biliary system and gallbladder, a calculus cholecystitis. Hypoperfusion to the pituitary is Sheehan postpartum necrosis or Sheehan syndrome. 
hypoperfusion everywhere is a state of shock. Here's the deal. During pregnancy, the pituitary experiences high demand, high demand for FSH and LH, high demand for prolactin, etc. So the pituitary will grow larger in size and therefore the blood supply to the pituitary will try to increase to keep up with the high demand and to keep up with the bigger size of the pituitary. However, if mom lost a lot of blood during labor and delivery, boom, now the pituitary is left big in size without enough blood supply, i.e. ischemia and necrosis. Can this lead to panhypopituitarism? Yeah, the pituitary will lose everything, including prolactin, and that's why mommy will be unable to lactate, a classic sign of Sheehan postpartum necrosis of the pituitary gland. Here's a case for you. Please pause. What's that? Sudden severe headache by Timber. It looks like Sheehan, but came sudden severe headache. What's that? Sudden double vision. What's going on? This patient did bleed into a pituitary adenoma, leading to sudden hypopituitarism. Next, empty cell syndrome. This is the cella turcica, which is the home of the pituitary gland. Sometimes, instead of finding an anterior pituitary, you find it flattened, and this space is filled with cerebrospinal fluid instead of a pituitary. Can this lead to loss of all of these hormones? Yeah. Can this lead to cryptorchidism or hidden testes? Yeah, because testes need testosterone to descend. When there is no testosterone, they can remain stuck in the abdominal cavity. So this is what happened. Instead of a pituitary gland, we have a flattened gland and the space has been filled with CSF instead of a gland. Can empty cell syndrome caused by temporal hemianopia? Only if it is secondary empty cell syndrome started by a tumor. Can empty cell syndrome have pressure atrophy? Absolutely yes. Now we know everything here, but we have to talk about primary hypothyroidism as a cause of hyperprolactinemia. How did that happen? Primary hypothyroidism means that the thyroid hormone is low because of a problem in the thyroid gland itself. So T3 and T4 will go down. As a negative feedback, TRH from the hypothalamus will go up. TRH is trying to tell the thyroid, hey, make more thyroid. However, it's the same TRH that boosts the prolactin release. That's why primary hypothyroidism is a cause of hyperprolactinemia. So when a patient comes in complaining of the symptoms of hyperprolactinemia, we check for prolactin, we check for dopamine, and we check for thyroid function. This is how you become a good doctor, not a doofus with a stethoscope. Next, what happens if I injure my hypothalamus? If my hypothalamus is toast, GHRH is down and growth hormone is down. CRH down and ACTH is down. TRH is down and TSH is down. GNRH is down. FSH and LH are down. Dopamine is down. And dopamine was the prolactin inhibiting factor, therefore prolactin is up. So when my hypothalamus is toast, all of my pituitary hormones are decreasing, except prolactin is increasing. Can I develop the symptoms of hyperprolactinemia? Absolutely like impotence, gynecomastia, galacturia, amenorrhea. Cannot grow, cannot metabolize, cannot raise my blood sugar. Reproductive problems. Galacturia, amenorrhea, impotence, and gynecomastia. All of these can be seen after a very bad car accident where I injured my hypothalamus. Why do we call it hypothalamus? It literally means under the bed. Who's the bed? The thalamus is the bed. Why is the thalamus the bed? Because it lies beneath the telencephalon. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. And there you have it. Hyposecretion of prolactin, causes and effects. And hypersecretion of prolactin, causes and symptoms. After you understand physiology, it makes sense to master pharmacology. Download my endocrine pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionetics.com. It will teach you about the different types of insulin, diabetic ketoacidosis, hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic, non-ketotic syndrome, and much more. If you want kidney physiology, I have a special course for that, also at medicosisperfectionetics.com. If you want more diseases like pituitary apoplexy and other emergencies, download my Emergency Medicine High Yields course. 
Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense.